Welcome back to Federal and Indian Gaming Law. Today we're going to talk about gaming advertisement, gaming advertising in the First Amendment. Uh, sorry about Wednesday. I was um, on Tuesday. I got I got pretty sick with uh, what I think was probably norovirus. So if anybody's had the pleasure, you'll know. Um, but it's about 48 hours of being down. Um, so thank you for your, your patience. Hopefully everybody received the email before class so you didn't show up, but uh, apologize for that. Again, today we're going to cover gaming, advertising, and First Amendment. But, you know, as we do often, you know, don't forget the things you learned earlier in the, in the year. You know, what does the Federal Wire Act cover generally? Remember that? It covers transmission and interstate or foreign commerce of bets or wagers or information assisting in the placement of bets or wagers on any sporting event or contest. Also prohibits the transmission of information of, uh, sorry, the transmission of money or credit as a result of a better wager. And again, it has the information assisting prohibition again twice. And there's an exemption for information assisting between jurisdictions where that type of wager is legal. And remember what the Illegal Gambling Business Act covers generally? Prohibits anybody from owning, managing, financing, supervising, directing, or conducting an illegal gambling business. And an illegal, illegal gambling business is one where five or more people do any of those things in violation of state gambling laws. And the business is in continuous operation for 30 days or more, or has revenue of $2,000 or more in a single day. So I guess the first question is, is there a right to advertise gaming services? Courtney. I think yes, um, just like any other commercial enterprise. Yeah, that's rooted in the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting or establish an establishment of a religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of people to peacefully assume, assemble, sorry, and to petition the government for redress of grievances. So that free speech right has some protection for advertising gambling services. So what kind of speech gets protected by the First Amendment? Or what political speech? Yes, I think that's like the most protected. It is. It is. People have used political speech to um, to, <laughs> to to cover a lot of things. What about religious speech? Again, same. What about all personal speech? No, there are some limits. Most personal speech, absolutely. But, you know, the famous example of yelling fire in a crowded theater when there is no fire is not protected speech. Inciting violence is not protected speech. And again, what is this speech protected from? Can your employer tell you, we don't like your speech for, we're gonna fire you? Yeah. Protects it from government interference. Your employer generally isn't the government. For most of us. Then there's commercial speech. And commercial speech gets protected, but it's not protected in the same way that political speech or religious speech or even personal speech is protected. There are more limits on commercial speech than there are with the others. I mean, could you 
as a business, you know, advertise we're selling cars for $15 a car when you're not just to drive traffic to the car lot. No, that's probably deceptive. And there are laws against that, laws are government expressions, therefore, no. So how would you define commercial speech, just in general? No thoughts? Really, really in the morning on a Monday? Courtney. I, I think I said it earlier, just like business speech, anything that's like promoting business, but. That's, that's not a bad way of doing it. I mean, it's, that, that's reasonable. Alex. Yeah, kind of along that lines, maybe kind of anything that advances like a commercial or like monetary interest in some way. Absolutely. You're getting really close to the definition. Uh, the leading case on this is always Central Hudson. I don't is there, if anybody's taken this in another course, um, but Central Hudson's going to come up. And yeah, it's expression related solely to the economic interest of the speaker and its audience. And this becomes more interesting because most businesses are formed, you know, whether it's a corporation or an LLC, with a mission or a purpose to generate revenue. They are solely economic entities. Its sole purpose is to earn revenue. So there were a lot of cases coming down before Justice Scalia, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, Justice Rehnquist passed away that might have altered this quite a bit, but it didn't happen. And, the, and it centered around Nike, You're familiar with Nike shoes. So Nike had an advertisement about how wonderful uh, their shoes were and how you know their shoes are, are manufacture of their shoes benefits people around the world and a human rights organization uh, put a big ad in, I think it was this paper in Seattle uh, saying or in uh, Oregon, sorry Portland, saying that you know Nike's, factories exploit workers in third world nations and it lists the number of people that died in Nike factories overseas and things like that. And Nike fired back with, you know, that's not true. We, we, we have uh, most ethical uh, factories in the world and raises the standard of living for people in poor countries. And, and the, Human rights groups sued under deceptive trade practices, saying that's that's not true. You know, you, there are documented cases where Nike workers who have missed a stitch in a shoe or made an error in making a shoe have had to run laps until they collapse, and things like that as as punishment. And uh, it was going through the courts, and Nike was claiming that this was political speech or or some other type of speech, but it wasn't commercial speech. They eventually settled. Um, but it was interesting because up until now, and, and still currently, most speech by corporations and LLCs, companies, commercial companies, is deemed to be commercial speech because they are commercial entities. <clears throat> Their sole purpose for being is a commercial entity. At the end of the day, that's what they are. They may have, you know, MGM may have given a lot of money philanthropically, and Caesars may give a lot of money philanthropically, but that doesn't mean they're not commercial entities. So, you know, again, the First Amendment is applied to the states through the 14th Amendment which protects commercial speech from unwarranted government regulation. So states can't pass laws that limit commercial speech in an unwarranted manner. 
So what's the test for determining whether a government prohibition is unwarranted? Well, Central Hudson gives us a test, conveniently. First part of the test is, does the speech concern an illegal activity or is it misleading? You know, and here's where Nike was gonna have some issues. You know, is it misleading to have an advertisement that says, well, you know, our, or a large ad, advertisement that says, I shouldn't say advertisement, large piece in a paper that claims that your factories are the most ethical factories in the world and they're nothing but benevolent for the people that work there. Um, you know, is that misleading? Eh, probably. Given the evidence, it's probably misleading. Um, so you can have state laws and federal laws that prohibit illegal uh, promoting illegal activity. <clears throat> there was an issue like this in San Diego back, I think, in the eighties, where there were there was a group of people from the other side of the border that were offering to kidnap or murder anybody you want. And they had little ads in the classified section of, of small newspapers in the San Diego area, not protected speech. Government can shut that down. And again, if it's misleading, you can shut it down. Second part, Assuming that the speech is not misleading or doesn't concern any illegal activity, does the restriction serve a legitimate government interest? Because the government shouldn't be restricting speech that has no interest in actually restricting. So there has to be some legitimate government interest that is served. Does that restriction directly advance the government's stated interest? So if you're going to restrict speech, not only do you have to have a good reason for doing it, but the restriction has to actually, actually advance that reason. And then for, is it no broader than it has to be in order to serve that stated interest? So for example, you might have an interest in, in not uh, in reducing DUIs in your state. You might be able to advance that interest by prohibiting uh, happy hour advertising. Does that restriction actually help it probably does. You know, people that drink a lot like to save money too. Uh, but is it no broader than necessary to serve the government's stated interest? And that's a good question. So with that, you've got this four-part test. And that four-part test is still good law. It gets used a lot. Like I said, there was some movement uh, during the Rehnquist, the end of the Rehnquist years to maybe take this on and alter it, but it stands today. So let's take a look at some advertising and see if it uh, is something a government could regulate or not. What about this toothache remedy? Yeah, I think you probably can. Does, does the speed promote an illegal activity? Yeah, yeah. yeah cocaine may be very good at, at numbing your teeth. I, I don't know, but... Uh, but it's a controlled substance, so illegal. Government can prohibit that. Now, back in 1885, there was no pharmacopoeia. 
everything was legal. Um, and in fact, you had some doctors thinking that people should take cocaine every day. Um, they thought it was a miracle drug. Turned out, not so much. How about this advertisement? Parachute lessons. For hijacking and other fun. Generally hijacking's illegal. Austin. I just wanted to uh, clarify. So for the last one, if it's illegal or misleading, then the government can regulate it. You don't have to worry about part two, three, or four. Right. Okay. Yeah. Once you fail that for government has interest in regulating it. You know, like the ads in, in the alternative papers in San Diego offering to kill people for a fee. Um, or them and bring them to Mexico. That's um, no, no, no dice. Government can restrict that advertising. Courtney. I have a question. If this was just like a joke, so the uh, it's just like joking about hijacking. Yeah. Is that different? It is. It is. If it's obviously a joke, yeah. Then you're you're fine. That's that's called puffery. And let's see if we can pull one of these out. All right. I'm glad you brought that up. So let's years, doctors are going to eat foods low in fat and high. Let me change the share. All right. Hopefully you can hear this. For years, doctors have urged you to eat foods low in fat and high in fiber. Apparently, See? we got that all wrong. A new study shows that men and women should eat more stuffed jalapenos and bacon cheddar potato wedges. Tests prove that when added to your meal, whole jalapenos stuffed with three kinds of cheese and bacon cheddar potato wedges can remove wrinkles. Furthermore, I believe bacon prevents hair loss. Where did you find this guy? Tobacco company. <laughs> so what about that ad? I think that's like what Courtney was talking about because that was funny. Yeah, it's funny. You know, I don't think anybody really believes that jalapeno poppers are going to extend your, your life and make you healthy. <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous. It's funny. Let's pull up the next one here. Let's... So I've got my essay written Oops. and I've been working on it for about a week. So now I'm going to show you how I use Grammarly to edit. All right. Other jacket the box, yeah. There? Still here? Yeah, uh, Payet! Dude, don't stress. Stick with the classics. Order my famous tacos. Crunchy, tasty, and totally affordable. Like the rest of my value menu. How many should I get? 30. <laughs> That's what I was thinking! <laughs> You know, by the way, that, that that was done before we had legal dispensaries in any states. <laughs> and it was controversial. Let's pull up one more, I think. But, uh... Yeah, can I get 99 tacos for two cents? We can't do that. Um, I'm looking at the sign, and it says 99 tacos for two cents. Dude. It's two tacos for 99 cents. That's even less. Pick up two of Jack's classic tacos. They're totally tasty and at 99 cents, totally affordable. You weren't really going to eat 99 tacos, were you? No. Yeah. <laughs> so let's bring it back to... So, you know, oops. 
Let me get the other share back up. So those are good examples of humor and puffery. You know, the last two ads were a little, a little more dicey. Um, and they were shown in states where, you know, uh, like I said, dispensaries weren't legal. And, and clearly there was a reference to some kind of drug use by, by the main character in that ad. Um, but they were deemed to be funny rather than uh, promoting an illegal activity. And the same thing with the jalapeno poppers ad. Um, you know, it, it was so ridiculous. That one didn't cause any controversy unless you worked for a tobacco company. But, um, you know, generally deemed to be funny. You can do that. You can engage in puffery and in humor as long as it's really clear what that humor is. Now, there have been other advertising campaigns that sort of got close across the line. Uh, I want to say it was the... It was the Cartoon Network or the Comedy Channel, I can't remember, did a promotion. Um, what what station has Aqua Teen Hunger Force? Do you remember? No. It was popular, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. And they had a movie coming out. And as part of the promotion for that movie, they were putting unmarked packages that looked like explosives around the Boston area. You know, and that crossed the line. <laughs> you had police coming out to disarm what were just basically advertisements for a movie. So, um, yeah, I can't, can't do that. You know, when the, when the activity kind of crosses the line into, into that looking like it's something illegal, run into some trouble. Which brings us to gaming. You know, with respect to gaming, we do have laws that limit some commercial speech. You know, for example, the first restrictions on gambling were really in the late 1800s as postal regulations prohibiting the transportation or importation of lottery tickets and prize lists. And you couldn't advertise that. That was expanded by the 1934 Communications Act. So the 34 Communications Act echoed what we have the 1800s legislation, and it prohibited anybody that owned a radio or television station from permitting the advertisement of any information concerning a lottery gift enterprise or similar scheme or offering prizes dependent and whole or part, oops, uh, or, a, or a scheme offering prizes dependent and whole and part upon chance. So kind of going back to our first weeks of class, essentially you couldn't advertise gambling on public airways. There was a prohibition on it. Each day's broadcast shall constitute a separate offense. FCC has regulations similar. So it prohibits the broadcast that, that information on class A television, AM and FM stations. But it has a bunch of exemptions. Uh, State-run lotteries, as long as the broadcast is within the state. So in California, you want to broadcast, advertise California State Lottery on radio, fine. The broadcast has to be within California. Broadcast in an adjacent state that also has a, a legal lottery. And in any states with legal lotteries, you can run, you can run lottery advertising. Um, you can advertise nonprofit games, so sweepstakes, things where there's no entry fee. Horse racing, you can advertise. Poker tournaments, because they're not gift enterprises. 
and have more skill than a lottery. And then Native American casinos can advertise as part of IGRA. Now, what this ended up creating was a really odd set of advertising rules for casino operators. In fact, casino operators used to have restrictions on, on what they could do such that when the Borgata opened up in uh, New Jersey, they had ads for the Borgata, but you could only advertise the hotel. You couldn't advertise its gaming services other than to say the Borgata Hotel and Casino as part of the name. You couldn't have the sound of slot machines. You couldn't show slot machines except if they were really incidental as part of the background. And you ended up with some really creative ads with people on scooters riding around the New Jersey shore. Um, and it really didn't highlight gambling. Uh, and that was true everywhere. So casinos just couldn't advertise casino products or casino services over the airwaves, on TV, on radio. Now you could say, you know, the Las Vegas Club Casino is having uh, all you can eat prime rib buffet on Thursdays, fine. You're not promoting the gambling services. The only time you mention the word casino is as part of the name. And that's incidentally why so many casinos have casino as part of their name. You know, it's not like McDonald's hamburger restaurant. You know, Taco Bell, cheap fast food, Mexican style food. <laughs> Olive Garden, cheap, not so fast Italian style food. But if you notice, casinos usually put casino hotel right, right in their name. And part of the reason was for advertising. Which brings us to Posadas. Anybody remember the facts of Posadas? I'll kind of go through it. So there's a casino in Puerto Rico that ended up getting disciplined for violating Puerto Rico's advertising limitations on casinos. They had things like pens, pencils, matchbooks, notepads that advertised that casino. And the law in Puerto Rico prohibited advertising gaming facilities to residents. They wanted the benefits of casino gaming, but they didn't want the downside of casino gaming. And so this company gets fined on a number of occasions and their ads get reviewed by the tourism development company, which is part of the government of Puerto Rico. And again, they use the word casino on things like matchbooks, lighters, envelopes, uh, correspondence, invoices, pencils, you know, the things that you would normally see corporate branding on in almost any setting. And they did so on billboards. Now, they didn't advertise gaming services directly, but they used the word casino, like you would, oh, in the mainland US. So, how does the court address this? Do they use Central Hudson? Well, they say they do. Because the case involves a restriction on pure commercial speech, which does no more than propose a commercial transaction, our First Amendment analysis is guided by the general principles of Central Hudson. Now we're gonna go through a few of these cases because the view on the First Amendment's protection of speech related to gaming services has changed over time. I don't know if anybody's taken con law. And if you have, if you've looked at how the courts changed over time, but during the Rehnquist years, 
you had a lot of fractured opinions. So you'll have three justices concurring on parts A and C and two justices dissenting on parts A and C. You know, it's it's all over the place. And those decisions are probably less reliable uh, with regard to stare decisis than others because they, they hang by a thread. But back to this. So the court does use Central Hudson. Is the speech illegal? Does it promote an illegal activity? Is it misleading? Here the court says, no. You know, this is concerning a lawful activity. So therefore, if it's lawful and it's not misleading, we can move on to the next steps. Does the restriction serve a legitimate government interest? Now, the tourism company, which is part of the government of Puerto Rico, explained in its brief that excessive gambling among local residents would produce serious harmful effects on health, safety, and the welfare of Puerto Rican citizens, such as disruption of moral and cultural patterns, an increase in crime, fostering prostitution, the development of corruption, and the infiltration of organized crime. Now, did the tourism company or the government of Puerto Rico have to provide any evidence of this? No. The court said, well, we have no difficulty concluding that the Puerto Rican legislature's interest in health, safety, and the welfare of its citizens constitutes a substantial government interest. So, Courtney. Oh, I was just going to say pretty much any time it seems when the government alleges it's for like the safety and welfare of their residents, then that's going to be considered a legitimate government interest and they don't need to really go further. Yeah, exactly. Here, that's the case here. The court just basically takes judicial notice of whatever the state is saying, the government is saying, and they move right along. So does that restriction actually serve that interest? Well, court said we have no difficulty concluding that Puerto Rico's legislature's interest in the health, safety, and welfare of its citizens, you know, they, it constitutes a legitimate interest and this speech, this restriction serves that interest. Because if you start looking at that two-pronged fit, you know, you know, yeah, there's this legitimate interest. State says that this advances that interest. We're willing to agree that. But is it no broader than necessary? Well, then you start looking at fit. And I'm sorry, uh, you start looking at whether that, that restriction actually does serve the interest and whether it fits. And the Puerto Rican, you know, the court says the Puerto Rican legislature obviously believed when it enacted the advertising restrictions that advertising of casino gambling aimed at residents of Puerto Rico would serve to increase demand for the product advertised. And we think the legislature's belief is a reasonable one. And the fact that appellant has chosen to litigate this case all the way to the court indicates that appellant shares the legislature's view. Wow. And again, the state doesn't have to prove that this actually, actually promotes that interest or advances that interest. The court's just gonna take judicial notice of that again. So how does it, well, do that, essentially the court defers to the legislature. The court ignores unregulated advertising for other forms of gambling. Again, Puerto Rico has, excuse me, has a racetrack. Racetrack's not subject to this. 
Puerto Rico has lottery. Lottery is not subject to this, but that doesn't bother the court at all. So essentially the court is saying, well, if the legislature says it has an interest and that this restriction advances that interest, the court's really willing to accept that as long as it's not manifestly unreasonable. What about B being no broader than necessary? Again, remember Posadas, you know, the casino just had its name on stationery and pens and pencils and napkins and things like that. Billboards that were not promoting anything, any gambling activity at the casino. Well, again, the court says, eh, well, we think that it's clear that the statute and regulation satisfy the fourth step of the analysis. The narrowing constructions of the advertising restriction announced by the Supreme Court ensure that the restrictions will not affect it. advertising of casino gaming aimed at tourists, but will apply only to such advertising when aimed at residents of Puerto Rico. You know, because pens, pencils, matchbooks, things like that can end up in the population. And then the court goes on to say that in their view, the legislature's greater power to completely ban casino gambling necessarily includes the lesser power to ban the advertising of casino gambling. Sort of a bright line rule. If a legislature can make the activity illegal, it can take the lesser included power of just banning advertising on that activity. It is precisely because the government could have enacted a wholesale prohibition of the underlying conduct that it is permissible for the government to take the less intrusive step of allowing the conduct, but reducing the demand through restrictions on advertising. It's pretty bold. Kind of gut central Hudson in a way. Because now, if, well, we could make this illegal. We can make the sale of liquor illegal. We can make the sale of tobacco illegal. We can make lots of things illegal. Therefore, we can now, if we can make it illegal, we can take the lesser included power of allowing the conduct, but reducing demand through restricting advertising. So what are your thoughts on that? You know, what are things you could make illegal? Alex? I mean, it, it certainly seems very, very broad and potentially uh, dangerous ground as applied potentially in other contexts, you know, uh, which is foreseeable, you know, of course. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's really a broad statement. And the governor of Puerto Rico is thrilled with this. Absolutely thrilled. And this came from the Supreme Court. And ultimately, the Supreme Court said, well, basically, if the legislature says it it's serves a legitimate interest, it has a legitimate interest, then it does. And if it says this serves the legitimate interest, then it does. And if they think it's no broader than necessary, then, okay, it's no broader than necessary. So they basically are very, very deferential to the local legislature. And then they include that bright line rule, which is really somewhat amazing. You know, it was um, it was remarkable at the time. So let's move on to the next one: edge broadcasting. Anybody read this one, Alex? Yeah, this one was interesting because so the radio station was in north carolina was you know licensed in north carolina by the fcc but like over 90 percent of its listeners were actually in like the neighboring virginia it was actually like closer to the virginia border than 
yeah. really anywhere in North Carolina. And the lottery was legal in Virginia, illegal in North Carolina. They wanted to ad- broadcast over the radio, you know, advertisements for the Virginia State Lottery. But obviously, since they were in North Carolina, where it was illegal, presented this dilemma regarding the the federal statute and whether that was allowed or not. No, that's exactly it. So you have a radio station that's on the border with North Carolina and Virginia. More than 90% of its audience is in Virginia. The competing radio stations in Virginia are taking lottery ads for the West, for the uh, Virginia lottery. And the North Carolina station wants to take those ads too because they pay well, you know, they pay rate card. Um, and they sue federal government to get relief on this because they're told they can't do it. So in the district court, how does the district court decide this? Well, is the speech, does the speech concern an illegal or misleading activity? No, Virginia lottery is legal in Virginia. Is there a legitimate government interest in limiting that speech? And the answer is yes. Because the federal policy is to respect both the positions of states that want to have state lotteries to have them and the position of states without state lotteries to not have them. And does the restriction serve the government's stated interest? Well, the district court says not as applied to EDGE. Because as applied to EDGE, this makes no difference whatsoever. Their audience is in Virginia. Their competing radio stations are in Virginia. Taking that advertising off that station won't impact North Carolina one bit. The same people in North Carolina that can hear this station can hear the Virginia stations. Um, And then, you know, is this ban, this restriction no more extensive than necessary? It agreed. But see, it failed that third prong. And so the government appealed. And it goes all the way up to the Supreme Court again. And do they apply the central Hudson test as it goes up the chain? Yeah. First thing they have to determine is whether the expression is protected by the First Amendment. And the first prong is, is that it must concern illegal and lawful activity and not be misleading. And then next, they ask whether the interest is substantial for the government. And then they ask if it's no more, or whether that restriction has a plot, whether that restriction directly addresses the government's stated interest, and whether it's no more extensive than necessary. So again, on the first prong, does the speech concern an illegal activity? No. No, they agree with the below that the advertisements for the Virginia lottery are not promoting an illegal activity. They would promote illegal activity in Virginia. Again, you can't buy Virginia lottery tickets in North Carolina anyway, but you can cross the border and go to Virginia and buy a lot. Does Restrictions serve a legitimate government interest. And here again, you know, the court says that we're quite sure that the government has a substantial interest in supporting the policy of non-lottery states, as well as not interfering with the policy of states that permit lotteries. Does the court require any proof that this is a legitimate government interest? No. 
doesn't require any evidence or any proof. They just say, if the government is saying it, we're willing to accept that. Then they kind of jump to the last one, the fourth one, before they get to the third. And they say, is the re re regulation or restriction no broader than necessary? And again, they agree the statutes are no broader than necessary to advance the government's interest. And therefore, that fourth part of the test is satisfied. Now, do they require proof of this? No. They're okay with whatever the government says. If the government says this is no broader than necessary. We're okay with that. But what about that third prong? Where the district court said that the restriction didn't directly advance the government's stated interest and therefore shouldn't be re regulated as applied against EDGE. Alex? I mean, they ultimately say that it does, uh, but their analysis here was kind of odd because they kind of put this and like the fourth factor together and kind of just generally considered like the fit of the like restriction uh, or the regulation uh, to the speech. So it was a little interesting how they applied it here. It is. And what they say is that it doesn't matter whether the restriction advances the government's interest in this case. Whether it directs, or whether it directly advances the government's interest as applied to a single person or entity isn't the question under Central Hudson. It's whether the policy overall advances the government's stated interest. And therefore they said, the courts below asked the wrong question. This is not to say that the validity of the statute's application to EDGE is irrelevant, an irrelevant inquiry, but that the issue properly should be dealt with under the fourth factor of the Central Hudson test. You know, is it no broader than necessary and is there a fit? Looking back at Posadas. Having established that the state was entitled to protect its interests by applying a prophylactic rule to those circumstances generally, court declines to require the state to go further to prove that the state's interest in supporting the rule is actually advanced in a particular case. So what they're saying is that this is a policy the policy advances the state's interest. If in a particular case it doesn't occur, that doesn't make the policy invalid. And it's going to apply regardless. It's not whether this restriction affects edge, it's whether the restriction is valid because it the government has a stated interest, a substantial interest, the interest is served by this restriction and it's no broader than necessary. And here it is, even though as it applies to edge, it doesn't matter. So it does make a difference whether the policy is effective in any particular case, we're looking at it in a broader context. What do you think? I don't know. I don't personally like how they have a test and then they say like, like they just change their test and merge the two um, latter points together. But yeah. that's okay. They're the court, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, they do. And then, you know, like, like a lot of tests, there's some flexibility in there. Alex? There was like one part in their opinion where they're they mentioned how like the people in North Carolina would get like the Virginia lottery ads anyways, because like right. from the Virginia radio stations and they kind of quickly dismissed that as like, oh, well, like that's not really relevant to our case. But like, I feel like it is, especially as it pertains to like the 
the directly advancing the government interest because if the point is to limit the amount of like state lottery ads in a state that doesn't have that doesn't have a legal lottery then i don't understand how like this is any different than what is happening i guess well what the court here is saying is that we are respecting the rights of north carolina to not have a lottery and to make and, and to say that lotteries are illegal in north carolina now you edge you availed yourself of the the more favorable tax environment in North Carolina, the lower labor costs of North Carolina. Um, but that comes with restrictions on advertising that are illegal in North Carolina. Even though your audience is in Virginia, and even though that North Carolina can get advertisements from Virginia residents. So the policy that they're upholding is that general policy of respecting to different states just because that policy isn't advanced in your case doesn't mean the policy is valid and it doesn't mean we're not going to enforce that policy in your case. Yeah, I have a question about this going the other way. Um, I was just wondering about it earlier, actually. So I'm from Southern Utah, which is just over the border from Nevada and Arizona, and we get all of the Las Vegas radio stations there, but obviously gambling is not allowed in Utah. So I just didn't know if there was anything that could be done or if like Utah tried to somehow limit those broadcasts um, in the state. Yeah, they could limit the broad, in theory, at this point in time after Edge, they could limit those advertisements if they were being broadcast from Utah stations. They wouldn't be able to restrict the Nevada stations, but they could restrict the Utah stations. And they can't like restrict the reception of the Nevada stations into Utah. No, okay. no. I just wanted to ask about that. I didn't think so. No, and that's really the issue here. It's the same issue. You know, it'd be like a, a station in, I don't know, uh, what's right across, St. George? Is that right across the border? A station in St. George, a radio station in St. George from uh, not allowing advertisements for Las Vegas casinos. Even though radio stations in Nevada can certainly do so. And the people in Utah can hear those Nevada stations just as well as the Utah station. But, you know, at least under EDGE, the radio stations in Utah would be prohibited from taking those ads. So, Government restrictions of commercial speech seem pretty strong, but there is, there is the, again, the, the, there's some fracturing among the justices. Again, not uncommon during the Rehnquist years. You know, if you actually look at it, you know, you'll have certain justices concurring in part, dissenting in other parts. Um, and, and these opinions are generally all over the place. And that's, you know, during the Berger years, if you're a constitutional scholar, you know, Chief Justice Berger really liked to have clear majorities and, and minorities in each court opinion. And it's pretty, you know, Berger court opinions are pretty simple. There's the majority opinion, and then there's usually a dissent, if there's a dissent. And that's it. Rehnquist years, there's sort of the majority opinion where each section of the opinion is either concurred with by certain justices or not. And then there's usually other parts where it's a partial dissent and you might have multiple dissents on different grounds. And it, it makes for a pretty, pretty interesting uh, series of court opinions. And this is nothing, you know, nothing you probably haven't heard in other, other classes, but so you have a you know, fair amount of differing opinions on the court. When we get to 44 Liquor Mart, which is not a gaming speech related case, but it really starts changing the way that the court looks at free speech. 
So 44 Liquor Mart is interesting. Anybody read that one? Get the get a chance. Anybody want to say it? All right. No. Uh, so Rhode Island prohibits advertising liquor prices. And two appellates, Peoples and 44 Liquor Mart, uh, have issues with that because Peoples advertises in Massachusetts, but not Rhode Island. And 44 Liquor Mart places ads with no pricing, but wow symbols, you know, those like yellow sunbursts and things like that on their ads next to photos of liquor bottles. And they get fined for violating the Rhode Island prohibition on ads with liquor prices. And these two liquor retailers file a deck relief action and it ends up going all the way to the Supreme Court. And here's a good example of a Rehnquist court opinion. Um, so you have Justice Stevens announcing the judgment of the court and delivering the opinions of the court with respect to parts one, two, seven, and eight. An opinion with respect to parts three and five, in which Justice Kennedy, Souter, and Ginsburg join. An opinion with respect to part six, which Justice Kennedy, Thomas, and Justice Ginsburg join. And an opinion with respect to part four, which Justice Kennedy and Justice Ginsburg join. This is a lot different than what we saw in many prior uh, uh, iterations of the Supreme Court. And this is not uncommon during the Rehnquist years. I mean, he, I don't think Justice Rehnquist did what Justice Berger did, which was sort of get, you know, go talk to the other justices and tell them, you know, we want clear opinions, either join or not join, or, you know, we're going to have pretty, pretty clear cut opinions, which makes a lot of those burger year opinion or burger justice or burger court opinions, pretty strong opinions in here. You know, if you get one justice that changes their mind on one part of the opinion, it changes everything. It's, just, it's all over the place. So what do you think the state's arguments are going to be on this? Courtney. Um, just real quick on the whole Supreme Court thing. I think it's even gotten worse lately, like of everyone just having all these crazy different concurrences and joining parts of the opinion. But um, I think the state's arguments are going to be that they have an interest in like protecting their citizens from alcohol pricing and the wow stickers um, uh, indicate that like the price is low. So it's still like getting to it's still advertising yeah. of liquor. Alex. Yeah. I also think along those lines, kind of in the context of the Posadas and the edge cases, I feel like the state's going to be relying on this kind of deference to the legislature argument about like the, you know, kind of deferring to the legislator's judgment of like what the state interest is and that it's so long as it's like reasonable um, that like the action they are, you know, or the restriction, it, it kind of advances that interest. I feel like that's a big argument in, in this case. Exactly. I mean, if I were representing the state, that's exactly what I would do. I've got Posadas. I've got Edge. You know, Posadas is totally deferential. And it gives me a bright line rule that if I can make the sale illegal, then I can take the lesser included step of restricting speech about it. And in some states, the commercial sale of liquor is illegal. In some states, liquor stores are state owned. Not many, but they are. So, yeah, it, it, and, it, and with Edge, you know, even if, even if it doesn't really matter to the litigant, 
it's the policy that matters, not whether the policy as applied to that particular litigant matters, you know, coming out of edge. So the first thing they do is they address Posadas. Posadas is a pretty powerful court opinion. By the way, uh, if you go to Puerto Rico, they still think Port Posadas is really good law. Um, But the first thing they do is they say, we think the reasoning in Posadas is erroneous. The casino advertising ban was designed to keep truthful, non-misleading speech from members of the public for fear that they would be more likely to gamble if they received it. As a result, the advertising ban served to shield the state's anti-gambling policy from public scrutiny that more direct non-speech regulation would draw. Ooh, this is not looking good for Posadas. Given our long-standing hostility to commercial speech regulation of this type, Posadas clearly erred in concluding that it was up to the legislature to choose suppression over less speech restrictive, over a less speech restrictive policy. It's looking even worse for Posadas. Uh oh. We also can't accept that the state's second contention, which is premised entirely on the greater includes the lesser reasoning, endorsed toward the end of the majority's opinion of Posadas. Further, cons uh, further consideration persuades us that the greater includes the lesser argument should be rejected for the additional and more important reason that is inconsistent with both logic and well suited doctrine. At this point, I think Posadas is dead. So this is a real shift. And what about edge? How does the court address edge? I know. In edge, we upheld the federal statute permitting only those broadcasts, casters and states that had legalized lotteries to air lottery advertising. The statute was designed to regulate advertising about an activity that had been deemed illegal in the jurisdiction in which the broadcaster was located. So they distinguish edge from this case. They're gonna leave edge alone for now. So in the end, you get three justices that hold that truthful, non-misleading speech is entitled to greater protection under the First Amendment. You get three justices that suggest that no deference should be given to governments, asserted interest, and that strong evidentiary support must be presented uh, to preserve the ban for the for there are such a ban to be constitutional. Those are big, big changes. Again, truthful, non-misleading speech entitled to heightened levels of protection. And no deference to the government anymore. That deference we saw in Posadas, no more. The deference we saw in Edge, no more. You're gonna have to have strong evidentiary support government going forward. And this is huge. This is really big, big change. So now let's bring it back to gambling. And I'm not sure we'll finish this. If we don't finish this, We'll pick it up again on Monday. On Wednesday, we have a guest speaker. It's uh, Glenn Feldman. Glenn litigated the Cabazon case. So review the Cabazon case before Wednesday's class because you're gonna get a presentation from the guy that actually did it. Um, so Greater New Orleans. New Orleans procedurally is a mess. I said, I'm not sure we'll get through Greater New Orleans before in the next 15 minutes, but we'll, we'll try. So in the early 90s, the Greater New Orleans Broadcast Association challenged the constitutionality of the same federal law that EDGE challenged. It's based on that you know, lottery 
prohibition from the 1800s, gets carried over to the FCC and applied to television radio. Uh, in uh, November of 95, the Fifth Circuit affirmed the district court's decision ruling that the federal ban doesn't violate the First Amendment. So they uphold it consistent with Edge. On April 1996, they file an appeal to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court vacates the Fifth Circuit's decision and orders it to reapply the principles articulated by 44 Liquor Mart. 98, Fifth Circuit rules again that the federal ban on casino gambling advertisements don't violate the First Amendment. Greater New Orleans files a petition for cert. 1999, the Supreme Court agrees to hear the case, to hear oral arguments, and 1999, and this is their opinion. So what are the facts? Well, go ahead, Alex. I was going to say it's like very similar, but almost like a reverse edge in a way where they were broad a group of broadcasters. But the issue was that their broadcasts in Louisiana, where gambling was legal, could be heard in you know states like Texas, where it was illegal. And that was a problem for the FCC. That's exactly it. So they want to take advertisements for casinos in Louisiana, where it's legal. But those broadcasts are, are travel into Texas and Arkansas. Now, again, this isn't state lottery. This is commercial gaming. Remember, there's no exemption under that law. You know, we looked, we're on slide 59 now. Let me back up to, sorry, this is like going back on an old videotape, right? Ah. The, that law, this regulation, which is mirrors the law that prohibits the broadcasting of any enterprise, lottery, gift enterprise, or similar scheme offering prizes dependent in whole or part on chance, with an exemption for, again, state lotteries have an exemption to broadcast within their state. But there's no exemption here for casino gambling. Notice that. Exemption for state lotteries. So edge, fine, but not for casino gambling. Let's get back to slide 59. Yeah, we're not going to get through this today. So again, they argue that, hey, there's so many exemptions here, Indian gaming, state lotteries, horse racing, you know, but none for us. Uh, and the, the plaintiffs want to take ads for Louisiana, Mississippi private casinos. And those signals may travel to Texas and Arkansas. Now, Louisiana has no issue with this. But the federal government does, the FCC does. And so they bring an action under 1304, deck relief action, saying that as applied to them, the restriction is unconstitutional. Now remember, EDGE, does as applied to me matter? No. And it really doesn't get addressed in 44 Liquor Mart either. So does the court use Central Hudson? Uh, of course they do. In this case, there's no need to break new ground. Central Hudson, as applied in our more recent commercial speech, is adequate. So they're going to take, they're going to run through the Central Hudson analysis. Is the content not misleading? 
And does it concern lawful activity? Yeah. That's an easy one. Whether the asserted government interest served by the restriction is substantial. Well, states or the government says, well, you know, reducing the social costs associated with gambling and casino gambling and assisting states that restrict or prohibit casino gambling are good and substantial interests. What does the court think of that? Well, we're going to break from Posadas and Edge and go a little farther than 44 Liquor Mart. The court says, well, we can accept the characteriz characterization as substantial, but it's not self-evident. Uh-oh. This is really different than Posadas and Edge. And it takes a little farther than 44 Liquor Mart. The judgment of both Congress and many state legislatures is that the social costs that support the suppression of gambling are offset and sometimes outweighed by the countervailing policy considerations, primarily in the form of economic benefit. Hmm. Not, not looking good for the federal government at this point. You can't ignore, ignore Congress's unwillingness to adopt a single national policy that is cons that consistently endorses either either of the interests asserted by the Solicitor General. So they're not just going to take it for granted or take judicial notice that because the government says that as an asserted interest that is substantial that it actually is. They've looked at the countervailing arguments. Maybe it's not substantial. Hmm. Whether the speech restriction directly materially advances the asserted government interest. Again, court takes a look at this and then says, this burden is not satisfied by mere speculation or conjecture. Rather, a government body seeking to sustain a restriction on commercial speech must demonstrate that the harms it recites are real and that the restriction will in fact alleviate them to a material degree. So what is the problem the government's going to have with this? What do you think? Alex? I mean, they're going to have to show sort of that direct causation in terms of the restriction, which ultimately, you know, they're not able to do sufficiently. No. And then when we get to the, is it no broader than necessary? They said the government doesn't have to employ the least restrictive means, but it must demonstrate that it's narrowly challenged the regulation to, us, to the asserted interest. The fit doesn't have to be perfect, but it does have to be reasonable. Um, so they're breaking from all of the precedent as it relates to gaming advertising. So for starters, they say, as applied to petitioner's case, well, as soon as you say that, Edge is dead. Because this is an Edge, petitioner's, as applied to their case, was irrelevant. It's how does the policy work overall? Or, you know, whether the policy overall is supportive of that government interest. You know, it can't. 1304 can't satisfy the standards. The state's interest in reducing social costs are, you know, associated with casino gambling. That's that's their asserted interest. But any measure of the effectiveness of the government's attempt to minimize the social costs can't be ignored by Congress's simultaneously incur simultaneous encouragement of casino gaming on tribal land. So tribal casinos are exempted from this. Well. So are state lotteries. So are certain other contests and, and nonprofit fundraisers. And because you have all these exemptions, the Supreme Court said 1304 
is so pierced by exemptions and inconsistencies that the government cannot hope to exonerate it. So what they're saying is, okay, so your stated interest is to reduce the social costs associated with gambling, unless that gambling is horse racing, or unless that gambling is tribal casino gaming, or unless that gambling is state lotteries. Um, you know, as applied to the appellants, we want to take commercial casino gaming advertisements. Those are no different. So accordingly, the respondents can't overcome the presumption that the speaker in the audience, not the government, should be less to have left to assess the value of accurate, non-misleading information about lawful conduct. That's big. And so that's where we're at with the Supreme Court's view of gaming advertisements and restrictions on them. They're entitled, as long as it promotes legal gaming activity, they're entitled to a heightened level of First Amendment protection, just like every other commercial enterprise. They're no different. And again, Greater New Orleans is just about commercial casino gaming advertising. And this is a really, really hot topic now. I know we're, we're just a couple of minutes from, from running out of time here. But Edge does stay good law as it relates to lottery advertising because that this did not address the government's federal government's position and policy of respecting both the the states that have lotteries and the states that don't have lotteries so that stays but as it relates to commercial casino gaming which had no exemption under 1304 it's not applicable so what do you think? Greater New Orleans. Courtney. I like that the court sort of like returning back to more of a central Hudson thing and like saying that if the enterprise is legal, then you need to allow it to be advertised just like any other legal enterprise. Yeah. This is this is becoming a really, really hot issue in sports wagering right now. Now, around the world, you've seen, probably in the last five to eight years, you've seen increasing restrictions on sports wagering advertisements. Uh, so if Lewis is with us here today. Oh, Alex. Yeah, I just have a quick question. Um, so since this case... I guess what kind of interest or what does what needs to be shown by say the government to overcome this like in order to actually have like a restriction upheld now i think you'd have to sh show a substantial government interest that you'd have to have some evidentiary basis for it they're not just going to accept it so if it's gambling coming in with statistics information that shows that we're reasonable and that this is a substantial interest and there are substantial government costs. You know, for example, for gambling, there are social costs to gambling. And it's pretty well documented. It doesn't take much to get the, that information. But then your restriction is going to have to be relevant to addressing that, that government interest. And you're going to have to have sh show some proof. I mean, here, this is really where the federal government fell because a restriction on advertising may actually advance that interest. But when you have exemptions for horse racing, tribal gaming, and uh, state lotteries, how does that advance the interest anymore? Just restricting commercial casino advertising seems to be inconsistent with that policy. 
you know, as, as the court said, you know, the, that law and the regulations that flow from it are so full of holes that the government can't recover from it. You know, if, if you're going to say that advertising for gaming um, advances the state's interest of limiting the social cost of gambling, then you can't just say certain forms of gambling, or you're going to have to prove that only certain forms of gambling is sufficient or prohibiting speech about those activities really does still advance the state's interest in light of the fact that you're allowing other forms. And how does, and probably in this case, the most powerful was travel gaming. You know, from a consumer point of view, a social cost point of view, how is tra tribal gaming somehow better for the public? And how does, how does tribal gaming have fewer social costs than commercial gaming? You know, on the backside, it's helpful to tribes because it builds government, but the social costs are still gonna be the same. It's the same form of gambling. So distinguishing those makes no sense, and that's what the law was doing. And again, with regard to sports wagering, it's becoming a big issue. Uh, it, you know, in the UK, in the last few years, there have been some restrictions on sports wagering advertising, because sports wagering advertising was going wild there. Uh, continental Europe as well. In Italy, there have been restrictions recently Portugal, Spain, I believe, um, to restrict advertising with, with regard to sports wagering because they found that sports wagering is particularly attractive to younger people, particularly people that aren't of age. Oops, and we are out of time, I'm sorry. We'll pick it up here next Monday. Wednesday, we have Glenn Feldman who litigated the Cabazon case coming in to talk about Cabazon. Uh, it's a great presentation. You know, it's rare to get uh, somebody that's actually litigated uh, a key case like that to, to speak to a class. Um, because that really, that, that court opinion changed the trajectory of gaming in the United States. And certainly it changed the, the, uh, the fortunes of, of so many tribes. Uh, again, before Cabazon was, was litigated, there, you know, tribal gaming was, was pretty limited and it really changed the landscape. So with that, uh, I know we're way out of time.